Thank you all very much for coming. Um, just a bit of housekeeping out of the way. There are no fire alarm tests or anything today, so uh, the alarm does go off. It's right out the front door where we came in. A couple of people in here are expendable. Mary, for example, can go at the back because <laughs> she served her purpose already. She's lived her life twice over, so don't worry so much about her. Um, your phones are all turned off. We are videoing all day, OK? And the video is going to be made available to you. We're going to put it online so you can watch it back and uh, relive all the fun over uh, the next few days. So if it's all right with you, if we save, we'll have a question time uh, just before lunch, just after lunch, and then again at the end of the day. So if you, if you save your questions till then, or if you don't want to ask questions, if you want to write them down and just hand them in, and I'll just make sure I go over it. If you hand us a bit of paper at lunchtime, we can go over anything you want to talk about. We're going to try and cover everything. Obviously, there's an awful lot to try and cover today. So I've got a, a few PowerPoints that I want to run through with you and certain things. But if I'm missing something that is key to you, do let me know, because we're trying to get 10 years' worth of work across to you in sort of six hours. So I think I've got all the right stuff that you're going to want to hear. Uh, but if not, give us a little bit of direction. Tell us what you want to know about, and we can go into a bit more detail. We've got three wonderful people that are going to speak for 10 minutes only <laughs> today. Uh, Mary has changed. Mary, this is the artist formerly known as Mary. She's changed her name to Wombat, which stands for Wily Old Mary. And thriving of breathing and thriving. Breathing and thriving. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Claire Rogers from Newquay, who's just overcome emetophobia as well uh, with the programme, and the lovely, ah, oh, Layla. Hi. She's a tiny bit shy today, so we're going to give her a very big welcome later on. So we've got three people, 11, 11 to 113. So the gap is obviously huge, and Claire fits somewhere in the middle. So we're going to get through as much as we possibly can with you. Uh, your phones are off. What else was there? Fire alarm, done that, good. Okay, well let's start. Um, a number of you, I think about 25 of you, 24, 25 of you uh, have either had a meto, or have still got a meto, or just getting over it as we speak. So about 25 of you have got it, and I think about 10 of you are partners, friends, family. I think one of you's brought your entire family, which is good, thank you, and uh, then there's eight or nine of our Thrive Consultants here as well. The Thrive Consultants are very happy in the coffee breaks and the lunch break to answer any questions that you've got. So uh, they're here for the day, so I'd grab them and make the most of them while they're here. Um, we're going to have a coffee break at 11 o'clock for 20 minutes, half an hour. We've got a lunch break, one till two. And then we've got a coffee break again at 3.30. When we ran this in Copenhagen uh, a few couple of months back, the difficulty was trying to organise what sort of lunch 20 metaphobes might want. And we were in quite a long discussion <laughs> with the people uh, that run the place, and they'd never heard of a metaphobia, obviously, and the end menu they offered us was basically lettuce. <laughs> so we said that we'll bring our own lunch. So hopefully you've all brought some lettuce and water. <laughs> And uh, hopefully the weather's nice and we'll go outside and just wander around or go into the corner of the park or something at lunchtime. I think there's a cafe here as well that, that does biscuits and tea and coffee and stuff like that, so you should be OK. Any questions before we start? Before we start rolling? Excellent. If you do have a question as we're going through that you're just bursting to ask, and it's, it's incredibly pertinent, um, you can ask it and just put your hand up to say you've got a question and I'll just repeat it so we get it all on film, get it all on the tape. OK? Everyone happy so far? Anyone not happy? Good. Wonderful. OK, so welcome. Uh, this is the Curia Metaphobia and Thrive. First of all, we're going to talk a little bit about what the Thrive programme is and what is actually thriving. So a plant or animal is said to be thriving when it's growing, developing and flourishing the very best it can do in that particular environment. Okay? So it's not about being perfect. One of the, I'm already off PowerPoint, there you go, first slide, first slide and I've gone, I knew there was no point in doing a PowerPoint. Um, one of the biggest problems that a lot of metaphobes have is their perfectionism, and if there's ever a stumbling block to someone getting that last 
10% to the cure, if you like, it's almost always their perfectionism in some way, shape or form. Uh, so that's something to really watch out for. So thriving is not about being perfect. It's not about being perfect. It's not about not making mistakes. It's not about being fantastic all the time. It's not about being happy all the time. It's not about never having a dislike of being sick. No one likes being sick. Okay, you don't have to love being sick in order to consider yourself cured of emetophobia. I think that's perhaps pushing it a little bit too far. We're going to talk about it a little bit later. So all the way through it, you've got to think that we're not striving for perfection. Someone that is thriving is resilient. Okay, they can deal with any situation. They might have a tough time in a situation. They might have bad days. They might even have bad weeks. But it's about how quickly you bounce back, and it's how quickly you use the skills that you've got in order to bounce back. When a person's thriving, it's because they've got psychological skills, resources, and the right attitude to flourish in every area of their lives. They know how to maintain a physically healthy life and a mentally healthy life and be happy, confident, and successful. Thriving individuals have the self-insight and resources to overcome or avoid developing symptoms such as anxieties, phobias, or depression, and the robustness to fight more serious problems and illnesses. I don't know if any of you have seen the recent video we put of James Reck. Have you seen that? James is a lovely uh, chap. He's about 70. And he recently went through the program to stop smoking and overcome the uh, pain of the death of a loved one. His partner recently died. And he went through the program, stopped smoking, and was able to get on with his life. And then shortly after he finished his Thrive course, was told he had lung cancer himself and had six months to live. Um, He's going through chemo now, and they've extended that to a possible 12 months. But if you, I won't tell you any more about him, but if you look on our YouTube channel and watch his video, he's the most thriving person. He's happy, he's calm, he's relaxed, he's positive, he's in control. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think there's anything wrong with him at all. That's what thriving is about. It's about being resilient in difficult situations. Oh, here we go. Thriving is not about achieving perfection. I heard that before somewhere. It's about having the resilience to bounce back from adversity. It's being able to face difficulties and setbacks head on, knowing that you have the skills and resources to overcome things, overcome anything that you find in your way. It's about making the most out of your life. <laughs> Thank you, Fiona. Uh, embracing challenges, learning new things and enjoying yourself. I should have checked the photos. <coughs> Thank you. It is. Thank you for that. Uh, we all know people who are thriving. If you think about it for a minute, if you think about everyone knows someone who's thriving, if you think about someone in your life that you think never gets a cold or no matter what happens, if they get divorced, if they get ill, if they have problems in their life, they break a leg or something, they always seem to bounce back quickly. They always seem to have a smile on their face. They always seem to think, ah, oh, what's all right, we'll get over it, we'll move on, we can get through this. That's thriving. It doesn't mean to say they don't have bad things happen. It doesn't mean to say they don't have shitty lives at some point. Okay? What it does mean is they've got the skills and resources and the right attitude to move on from it to get moving again. So what's the Thrive Programme then? The Thrive Programme is a unique training programme that equips people with the skills, insights and resources they need in order to thrive. That's it in a nutshell. By working through a training manual, of which there are five at the moment, either alone at home or with the help of a trained Thrive consultant, anyone can now get themselves thriving, usually in around six to eight weeks. Through a series of simple explanations, exercises and actions, the student is guided through an exciting journey where they begin to grow psychologically stronger and fitter, more resilient every day. The student learns a great deal about applied positive psychology, learns how to recognise and then change any limiting beliefs they hold. They begin to create an internal locus of control, which means they feel a sense of personal power, a power to change their responses to events and experiences in their lives. The student gradually builds a strong sense of self-efficacy and self-belief. They learn how to create high, stable self-esteem, and they learn how to resist social pressures and overcome social anxiety. In short, they learn how to thrive. When you're thriving, you have strong psychological foundations, grounded and congruent belief systems, helpful thinking styles, and a positive attitude towards life. And this is our uh, formula here. So we're talking about what you want to be is somewhere in the middle of the non-spend diagram. You want to have the right amount of belief. So why is Thrive perhaps different to CBT? 
other than the fact it's about eight times more effective, it's because a series of techniques, particularly for someone like an emetophobe, a series of techniques isn't going to cure you of anything. Okay? Because you don't have the belief and the understanding about how they're going to work. I saw a lovely little boy uh, at the beginning of this week. Beginning, where are we? Saturday. Beginning of this week. And he's got ME and uh, has had anorexia and has emetophobia. And his mum brought with him a file about that thick from all these psychologists and psychiatrists that he's seen. And the thing that helped him most so far was a scribble diagram on a bit of paper. And I said, look, I'm really sorry. I apologise on the, on the half of the NHS. There's no way a scribble diagram is going to help your son overcome anything. He's got absolutely no belief that a scribble on a bit of paper is going to cure anyone of anything, let alone somebody who feels so powerless like that. So you've got to have the belief and the understanding of why it's going to work. Only then will you put in effort. When you think of it, oh, it's just another program, just another intervention. Oh, I've heard about this thing. I saw a video of some mad old woman talking about it. Don't answer that. I think I'll buy the book. I think I'll give it a go. It's not going to work. You're wasting your time, wasting your energy. You can have the book sitting on your shelf for months and months, as did Claire. It's only when she put it into practice did she cure herself in the space of about a month. Okay, and you, those of you that follow us on Facebook know that I had someone stay at my house a couple of weeks ago who cured herself of metaphobia and a drinking problem in five days. Okay, five days. Metaphobia and a drinking problem. She was drinking a litre of whiskey a day. I know, I know, I know, as an emetophobe, it's quite remarkable. But here it is, here it is. I'm glad there's some significant others here today because her mum, who used to be a nurse, told her that a single shot of alcohol would kill off any germs in the belly and you wouldn't be sick. Now you tell that to an obsessive person with a strong desire for control and soon they start having a shot every time they feel the tiny weeniest bit nauseous. So she was on a litre of whiskey a day and emetophobia. Within five days... Well, in fact, with one day she stopped drinking, uh, but within five days, completely over her metaphobia, completely over her drinking, and knows that she will never have either of those two things again. In fact, already last night she was able to drink socially and not as a safety seeking and avoidance behaviour. Now, she did work her backside off for a week. I'm not telling you that to make it sound like it's easy. It's not easy. From the three people you're going to hear about today, you're going to hear that it's hard work. You've got to put in a lot of hard work. You can't just read a book and expect to be cured. It's not going to work like that. You need to put in a lot of effort, but if you put in that effort, you will get over it. And she did it in five days. So that's, that's beliefs. You've got to have the resources. You've got to know what you've got to change in order to get better. You've got to know what you've got to change in order to be thriving. There's no point just putting in effort. I see a lot of people, I've seen thousands of emetophobes over the years, and often they put in a lot of effort... Um, but not the right effort. It doesn't matter how much effort you're putting in, it doesn't matter if you're working your backside off for eight hours a day, if it's not the right effort, it's not gonna do anything. You've gotta be putting in the right effort, you've gotta have the right skills and the right resources to tackle the right beliefs and the thinking styles that you've got that are causing the problem. And that's where the effort comes in. When you have the belief, when you absolutely believe, when you can see that if I do this, this and this, I can get over it, then you feel motivated, then you put the effort in. Unless you believe it's going to work, you don't put the effort in. Pregnant women, for example, find it incredibly easy to stop smoking. They stop smoking just like that. They don't tend to have withdrawal symptoms, side effects, or anything like that, because their attitude towards it has changed. They don't think, hmm, no, I really should stop smoking. I'd really like to stop. You know, I'm pregnant. I don't want to harm my baby. They say, I'm pregnant. I don't smoke anymore. And when they have that attitude, it's really easy to stop. But if, if someone goes into it thinking, oh, you know, I should really stop, I'm getting old now, and you know, it's, it's not going to be good for my health, it becomes very, very difficult because you're making it hard for yourself. So when you absolutely believe and understand how and why you will get over this, you have that epiphany, you have that moment where the light bulb shines brightly in your eyes, and then you work really hard, and within a really short space of time, you're over it. Very, very short space. It doesn't take long. You could do it in a day. Okay? I don't advise that you try, because being perfectionist, you're likely to give yourself a hard time if you don't, but you could do it in a day. Uh, Lisa did it in a day last week. You could do it in a day, and I'll tell you how later on. You'll understand how later on. 
Um, but I would advise you set yourself sort of five, six weeks. That gives you plenty of time to notice the thinking styles, notice the underlying beliefs, uh, tackle things like the perfectionism and the desire for control and things like that. But you could do it in a day if you really, really wanted to. So you want to be somewhere in the middle of that Venn diagram. You don't want, you don't want to believe it and have the resources and not put the effort in. Nothing's going to happen. You don't want to put loads of effort in without the belief. You certainly don't want to put loads of effort in without the right skills because nothing's going to happen. You're only going to make yourself worse, which is kind of how you got here in the first place. We can talk about that a little bit later. So I'm going to be right bang in the middle of that Venn diagram. I want you to think of the program um, as you're going through it as kind of building a jigsaw puzzle. Okay? And each step of the way, each chapter, each little bit of insight you get, each little bit of self-awareness that you get, obviously about yourselves, is another piece in that puzzle. It's only when you've got that entire puzzle completed in front of you that you have all the information that you need. Before you've got that complete puzzle, you haven't got enough information. So I was answering uh, a post on the uh, Metaphobia Facebook page the day before yesterday. Someone said, Rob, I see all these people are getting better. Why aren't I cured yet? I'm up to chapter seven. And I said, because you're on chapter seven. Yeah? You need to go through the whole program. If you're working through with the Thrive Consultant, that's different because they're going to take you through at a slightly different pace and a slightly different way. You need to know everything that's in that book. Okay? If you only know 90% of what's in the book, you're only going to put in 90% effort. Okay? And that means you're going to miss something. Okay? You want to know it inside out. You want to know that absolutely inside out. Okay? When you do, you'll put the right amount of effort in and you'll be doing the right resources, you'll have the right skills, you'll be doing the right techniques. Until that point, I wouldn't even try, because you're only going to set yourself up to fail, which is, of course, what's happened before with your CBT and your lightning process and whatever else you've done prior to now. So consider yourself building up a gradual picture. Each chapter, each time you learn something new, you're building up until you get to the point where you've got a complete jigsaw puzzle and you know where everything is. At that point... You have all the skills and resources you need, all the insights you need to be able to tackle it, to put the right amount of effort in and to get the right results. Any questions so far? Good. Talk about cognition for a few minutes then, at the first chapter. I want you to imagine that today, Every one of you, every one of us, has a set of glasses on. Some of, in fact, you do have glasses on. I want you to imagine that all of us have got a set of glasses on, a pair of glasses on, or contact lenses in, OK? And we've got those on all the time. Those of you that are wearing glasses that put them on today, you actually had a pair on before you even put them on, OK? Every one of us is wearing a pair of glasses the whole time. And these glasses sometimes have got a lens in, sometimes they've got two or three lenses in, sometimes they've got five or six lenses in. Now, I can't remember the last time I had my eyes tested, but it used to be they'd put on these big metal frames and slot in lots of different lenses, and then suddenly, oh, my God, you can see clearly. Everything's all wonderful. I want you to imagine that you've got a pair of those on all the time. Even when you're positive and happy and thriving, you've still got a pair of glasses on. You've got a pair of rose-tinted glasses on, haven't you? You've got a pair of positive glasses on. You're seeing things differently. We're always wearing a pair of glasses that we're filtering what we're witnessing in life. We're not experiencing life, are we? We're experiencing life through the filters of our belief systems, of our thinking styles, of the way we process experiences, the way we think generally. So all the time you've got a pair of glasses on. And all the time there's glasses. Sometimes they are sludge-tinted glasses. Be careful, there's a minor in the room. Sludge-tinted glasses. I could use that word in school, sludge-tinted. It's going to be difficult for me. It's going to appreciate... Um, sometimes they're obsessive glasses. Sometimes you keep going back and looking at the same thing. Sometimes they're perfectionist glasses. You might look at it and think, oh my God, that's not right. I've made an error in there somewhere. I've made a mistake in there. Sometimes they're learned helplessness glasses. If you're wearing your learned helplessness glasses and you look at this picture, you might be thinking about the poor little kid who's just dancing by the side of the beach. That any minute that person could fall in and get washed away. Okay, you might be looking through your negative glasses. I think that's typical, isn't it? You go to the beach one day and of course there's going to be a shark. So these, don't laugh, don't laugh. So these uh, um, filters are there all the time. On a good day, when you're thriving and you're in charge of your thinking and you're in charge of your belief systems, 
then those filters are having a very positive effect. You might see a grey, horrible day on the beach and mud and dog muck everywhere, but you still see a beautiful beach and that life's fantastic and it's a wonderful time and everything's going to be brilliant. You always wear these glasses. These things are always affecting you. You always have them on. Okay? You need to think about that the whole time. What glasses am I wearing right now? As you're sitting here right now, what are you wearing? What are you thinking about? How are you filtering what's going on in the room? Some of us are thinking the room is quite cold. I've seen a couple of you put your jumpers on, and yet a couple of you are wafting yourself to try and get cooler. Okay, we all experience things differently through the filters of our belief systems, our cognitive styles, and our helpful and unhelpful thinking styles. So, those of you that have only read the Metaphobia book, I've got the Metaphobia book, we haven't uh, introduced this concept into the Metaphobia book yet, but it's in the latest Thrive book that's coming out in a couple of weeks, and it will be in the newer version of the Metaphobia manual that will be coming out in a couple of months. But you won't need that, because, of course, you'll all be cured by then. Okay? I want you to think of the concept of foundations. So, we're going to start on a slight tangent. So, working through the book now, working through the program, that was an introduction to the Thrive program and what is thriving. What is thriving, what is the Thrive program? This now is working through the actual book itself. So if the Thrive program teaches you how to thrive, then anyone can use it. Why did I create a separate book for metaphobia? Okay. If the main book, if the main Thrive program book contains everything you need to know in order to be thriving, why create a separate book for metaphobia? Why are you so special? Well, what we found was the metaphobes, because of their general high desire for control and the fact they seem to know their own minds quite well, and I'm picking my words incredibly carefully <laughs> at the moment because there are lots of sharp things around the room, what they tended to do is get hold of the metaphobia book, or sorry, get hold of the Thrive book, skip the first 13 chapters and go right to the end and find out what it is they think they need to do in order to get better. Okay, I don't need to know that, I don't need to know that, I don't need to know that, I want to go straight to that. So, if you had to describe, if you had to think of a name that described an emetophobe's thinking styles as a kind of all-encompassing name, I would call it a problem-solving personality. Okay, problem-solving personality. Okay, you're really good at solving problems. Okay, you've got that ability to, to zoom in on something, got that ability to waft through what you think is important and what you think isn't important and dive straight into what you think is particularly relevant. And that's great when you know what you're doing. Okay? You're not experts yet at overcoming metaphobia, and yet you did seem to think that you were by skipping right the way through my life's work. It's okay, though. It's okay. absolutely fine. And going straight to the final chapter. Okay? And then saying, sending emails like, why aren't I cured? I've read the last chapter. Okay, so what we did, basically, we turned the normal emetophobia back to front, normal emetophobia book, and reorganised the chapters, obviously added in the emetophobia relevant research and everything else, uh, and made it, I don't want to use the word foolproof, but hopefully made it that you couldn't do it any other way than the way it's laid out in the book. Okay, so that's the main reason why you've got your own special book. There's nothing really different in there. Apart, the, apart from the emphasis on some of your particular thinking styles and beliefs that you couldn't have done going through the main Thrive book. But, of course, we know that the majority of you have tried other treatments before, other therapies before, all this other stuff, and you come to Thrive usually as a last resort, thinking, oh, God, I'm going to try something else. I heard about this, and we're going to go. So, actually, you, you don't necessarily give it your um, fullest attention straight away and work through the programme. Also, it's often quite difficult taking someone through a programme who already has some idea of what it is they think they're doing. Okay? So those of you that have been to therapists, for example, in the past, or those of you that are Thrive Consultants, know that the hardest person to help is someone that already has some prior knowledge. Okay? So what you don't want to do is make the mistake of going, oh, yeah, I know about that. We talked about that when I did my CBT. I don't need to know about that. Yeah, we did a little bit of that when I did my um, family dynamic counselling. I don't need to read Chapter 4. Okay? You want to assume, if you haven't started yet, that you know nothing about this. You want to assume that you know nothing and not try and integrate the Thrive understanding and insights and Thrive knowledge 
with stuff that you already know. You want to see it as something entirely separate. Okay? If you try and integrate it with knowledge that you already have, you're going to get misled a little bit because the jigsaw puzzle won't come together. Because, for example, my explanation of cognition might be different to the one you learned about with, with your CBT therapist. And the words might have slightly different meanings, which is why you've all got a glossary, by the way, in your handout today. So you've got, I'm very, very specific about what these words mean. So the word addiction, for example, means different things to different people. So try not to integrate the Thrive uh, information, the Thrive knowledge, the Thrive research, etc., with stuff you think you already know, because the stuff you think you already know might be flawed. Okay? So don't take that risk. Why take the risk? Assume it's only 200 odd pages. Assume you don't know any of it yet and read it and study it as an entirely separate thing and not try and make sense of this. Oh, yeah, because that sounds a little bit like that's kind of a bit like the reframe in NLP, isn't it? That's actually unhelpful. And it's only your desire for control that makes you do that. Normal people don't do that as much as you do. Okay? Normal people don't do that as much as you do. They don't try and relate things to other things because that's a symptom of desire for control, making sense of everything in relation to other things. Treat it as an entirely separate thing, and you'll get more out of it quickly. Um, emetophobes tend to have... I apologise about the term emetophobe, by the way. I should be saying a person with emetophobia, but it's just much quicker. Okay? Emetophobes tend to have very strong self-belief. Okay? Because of their black and white thinking, they tend, what they do believe, they tend to believe quite strongly and quite vociferously. The metaphobes are particularly good at what I call firefighting. We can look at this in a little bit more detail later on, firefighting. And one of the issues, uh, firefighting, you'll remember that you've got a picture of actually, the stressometer. We can look at that again a little bit later on, but the stressometer, if you imagine the stressometer with a picture of a, a small fire at the beginning and that fire getting bigger and bigger as you go round, because of your safety seeking and avoidance behaviors, which we'll talk about later on, safety seeking and avoidance behaviors, you are very, very skilled at firefighting. In fact, you're probably the most skilled of all people. And that is something to celebrate if you're a perfectionist, at being a firefighter. That what means you are really good at putting out fires. Okay? You are really skillful at avoiding one thing that, let's be honest, you don't particularly like very much. Okay? You're very skilled at that. You, you will not meet another part of the community more skilled at avoiding something they don't like. Okay? But you're also sometimes bordering on neurotic about it at the same time because firefighting is inherently anxiety-provoking. It doesn't matter how good you are at putting out little fires, whether those little fires are just thoughts in your mind, a rumble in your berry, belly, berry, belly, a worry about the fact that every one of you shook Rob's hand this morning. Did he wash his hands before he shook my hands? He did see him coming out the toilet. Okay? Those little unhelpful thoughts are little fires and you're very skillful about putting those fires out, and that's fantastic, and congratulations for that. However, you create so much anxiety by having firefighting thoughts, and your needle on the stressometer is always in the red, though you probably don't know it. You've probably lived your life with a needle in the red. And what I want you to start thinking about is instead of thinking continuously all the time, how do I put this fire out, how do I put this fire out, how do I put this fire out, I want to introduce the concept of you asking yourself, how do I stop building fires in the first place? Because that is a much better question to ask. How do I stop creating these things in the first place? Instead of focusing all of my efforts on firefighting and safety seeking and avoidance, think to yourself, what can I do to not build that fire? What can I do to not create that thought? What can I do to not create that anxiety in the first place? It's much, much easier and simpler to stop yourself getting stressed than it is to calm yourself down when you are stressed. It's much easier to stay calm and not get angry than it is to calm yourself down when you're angry. You know what it's like when you're angry. When you're angry, you see red, and, and what you think at that moment, you believe is absolutely the truth. When you calm down an hour or a day later, oh my God, I can't believe I said that to you. I do apologize. But at that time, it was real. It's much easier never to get angry than it is to calm yourself down from being angry. Mary, don't speak, Mary, we worked out during her 75 years as a metaphobe, had 8.2 million catastrophic anxiety-provoking thoughts about being sick, firefighting, 
Oh my God, did I wash my hands? Oh my God, I can't do that. Oh my God, is that there? I'm going to sit down. I'll have my peppermint tea. I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do something else. And it was those thoughts that are actually causing the phobia she had. The very thoughts she was having to firefight her fear, ironically, were the thoughts that were creating her fear. So the moment she stopped having those thoughts, she got better. The moment she stopped having those firefighting, um, safety-seeking and avoidance thoughts, I just said, hang on a second. Not once in, don't speak, not once in 75 years, not once did she say, do you know what, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe it doesn't matter that I shook their hand. Maybe it doesn't matter that I'm feeling a bit nauseous. Maybe, do you know, maybe if I was sick, I could put up with it. Maybe it's not as bad as I thought it was. Not once in 75 years did she think that. The moment she did, within eight weeks, nine weeks, she was over it. So your safety-seeking and avoidance behaviours, or firefighting, is probably 70 to 80% of the reason why you have a metaphobia in the first place. The things that you are doing to protect yourself is the very thing that's causing the phobia. And of course, this is why things like exposure therapy doesn't work for metaphobia. Because if you don't change your beliefs and thinking about it, you could go and be sick, it wouldn't make the slightest bit of difference. Could you still process it as terrifying and traumatic? So it's a different book layout and is uh, fairly unique to a metaphobia research within the meta book. So to be confident of a predictable and sustainable cure, and we're going to talk about what constitutes a cure later on, you must complete the whole program. You must apply the Thrive Formula, and we just talked about this with the other screen there. So in a little bit more detail there, resources refers to people having sufficient insights and skills. I can't read it on my small screen. Uh, to achieve their goals, this could include an understanding about how to achieve success, along with possessing any necessary psychological or physical capabilities. Effort refers to people showing determination and putting effort into achieving their goals. It could include taking action, persisting in the face of challenges, utilising any of their insights and skills. And beliefs refer to people having high self-efficacy in relation to achieving their goals, believing that they can achieve it. The more you believe you can achieve it, the more effort you put in. And you don't want to go into it in a lackadaisical, oh, I'll, I'll read it, yeah, I'll have a look at it, I'll see how I feel. You're not going to get anywhere with that. And also, if you read it that way, first of all, kind of out of interest and have the book on the floor and occasionally pick it up, by the time, excuse me, by the time you do do it properly, you've, you've lost your faith in the book a little bit because it didn't change your life the first time you read it. So now you're going to put less effort in the second time. So... Wherever you are in it, if you, wherever you are in it, if you're doing it by yourself and if you're not putting in 100% effort already, I'd go back to the beginning of the book, start it again and put in 100% effort. Do not leave any T uncrossed or any I undotted as you're going through that. Do every single one of those exercises. I promise you, you will overcome your metaphobia and you will thrive if you do that. I cannot promise you if you don't. Cannot promise you if you don't do that. That promise only exists if you do everything within the book the way I've laid it out for you. That's the same thing in a little bit more detail. So what happens if you don't work your way through the program, uh, the full program correctly? You won't get thriving. Okay? And another concept I want you to think about before you go any further is when you go through the Thrive program, although you're doing it for a metaphobia, I want you to think yourself of going through the Thrive program to thrive. Okay, you're going through the Thrive Programme to learn how to thrive. You're not going through it to overcome a metaphobia. That's inherently negative in itself and obviously makes you focus more on your metaphobia. Okay? And also, you're setting your sights quite short, aren't you? If you've got a programme that will teach you how to thrive, which is up here, why would you aim for overcoming something which is down here? So if you haven't already done so, switch your mindset to, I'm going through this program, I'm teaching myself how to get thriving. Along the way, I'm going to cure myself of a number of unhelpful things like a fear of being sick and perfectionist thinking styles and obsessing and brooding, all sorts of stuff. Okay? So you're going through the program to teach yourself how to thrive, not to overcome a metaphobia. You're going through the Thrive program to learn to thrive. Um, if you don't create strong foundations, which we're going to talk about in a minute, you have to work really hard at managing your thinking. You won't create new habits and beliefs. So Lisa, who came to see me, came to stay with me last week, 
had had the Thrive book for over a year. She, sorry, the Emetophobia book for over a year. She'd even had six or seven sessions with me. She's a friend of mine, by the way. She'd even had six or seven sessions with me sporadically. She'd build up her determination. She'd go away and she'd work really, really hard for two weeks, perhaps. Okay? She'd seen massive improvements. For example, about two months ago, she stopped drinking for six days by herself. She went from having 30 or 40 shots of alcohol a day, all day and all night, to having none all by herself within the space of three or four days. And then she had six days where she didn't drink at all, which was fantastic. Okay? She has one shot because she felt she really needed it, completely catastrophizes that one shot. Her perfectionist thinking kicks in. She feels so bad, she goes back to drinking one and a half bottles a day for the next six weeks because she feels so bad. She didn't praise at all the fact she didn't drink for six days and she beat herself up completely for the fact she had one tiny little drink. That's perfectionist thinking, black and white thinking, catastrophizing. Okay? That makes it very difficult to overcome something when you want to beat yourself up for the slightest thing but won't praise yourself even when you do something brilliant which is a big problem for metaphobes. But what she did, she'd had the book for over a year, she'd had various sessions, and she'd try for a couple of weeks, and she'd get a little bit better. She, in fact, overcame the metaphobe. Well, she didn't. She got much better, so she coped with it last year for a few months. But what she didn't do, she didn't do the programme well enough, long enough, for it to become a permanent thing. You've got to do it for five or six weeks. You've got to be absolutely on top of your game for five or six weeks. You've got to be thriving for five or six weeks before it becomes habitual. If you don't do it long enough, the moment you stop putting an effort, you're going to go back to the way you were because it's a temporary thing. This, again, is why things like CBT don't tend to be that effective for something like a metaphobia because very few people deliver it in a way that feels like an established, ongoing program that makes sense to you. It tends to be given as a series of techniques, and then you feel a bit better, so you stop doing them. You have to do them long enough uh, that, you, that you change fundamentally the way you think, the way you process events and experiences, and your, your belief systems, particularly your unhelpful belief systems. You've got to do it long enough. So don't just do it till you feel a little bit more alive, but oh, I feel better, I can relax a little bit now. That's the time when you really up your game and put in even more effort. Do it solidly for five or six weeks until it becomes habitual, then you can relax. If you don't do that, any progress will always be temporary. So the moment Lisa worked really hard for three or four days, that's it. And I'm getting texts off her every day. She's absolutely flying. She's absolutely thriving. Here's an arrow I made earlier. So if you want to think of not thriving to thriving as a kind of a journey, somewhere along the lines there, I want you to think of all psychological symptoms, all psychological symptoms, anything from personality disorders through to um, behavioural disorders, depression, anxiety, phobias, fears, things like ME, post-viral fatigue, anorexia, bulimia, self-harming, any disorder that's got any kind of psychological content okay, isn't something that is happening to you. It's something that you are doing. And it's a function of how much or how little you are thriving. So if you think of thriving for the time being as how well you manage your belief systems, how good and powerful and positive and helpful your belief systems are, and how good and powerful and positive your thinking styles are, and the general way that you process experience in life and your general kind of thriving attitude towards life, the worse you do that, the more likely you are to have symptoms, and the worse those symptoms are going to be. Okay? So your psychological symptoms are a symptom of your thinking styles. They're not a symptom of your life or what's happening in your life, or what's going around you in your life, they are a symptom of your thinking styles and your beliefs. It's that predictable. Okay, it's completely predictable. I said to the mother of this 15-year-old that I mentioned earlier in the week, I said, and of course they're feeling that life is completely unpredictable, and where's all this coming from? Where's all that happening? And I said, you know what, if you'd have brought your son to see me age 10 and told me about his thinking styles, I could have told you that by age 15 he would have either ME, anorexia, or emetophobia. It's predictable. It's not, it's not, oh my God, where's this coming from? What a huge shock, what a surprise. It's so unpredictable. It's the most predictable thing on the planet. It's as predictable as if I drop that balloon like that, it's going to hit the floor. Okay? It's that predictable that you have a metaphobia. 
It's not a surprise, it's not a shock. Oh my God, where did that come from? It's utterly, utterly predictable. When you see that, when you see how you've gone from your journey from here to here, it's really easy to get home again. Yeah? If I blindfolded you and dropped you in the middle of Norfolk and said, find your way home, it'd be quite difficult. Okay? And I have thought about it a few times as well. Yeah, I have thought about it. <laughs> or further away, Dartmoor, Dartmoor. But if you watch your journey, if you see your journey, you go from this point and you see how you've got to this place, it's really easy to find your way back. So I want you to think about it in terms of not thriving. And not thriving means unhelpful belief systems, poor processing skills, unhelpful thinking styles. The worst symptoms to have, the most likely symptoms you're going to have if you're really not thriving, are the symptoms that you've got. Okay? Emetophobia, anorexia, OCD, ME, chronic fatigue, all of those things, okay? And these are all 